<laughs> well, good evening and welcome to our midweek Bible study on Thursday nights. We're going through the Bible book by book and chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And tonight we find ourselves in the book of Isaiah. We finished chapter 9 last week and tonight, Lord willing, we're going to make it through to chapter 10. And then because it's the first of the month, we are at the conclusion of our time, going to partake together of the communion table. We'd encourage you, uh, those of you that are joining us online, if you want to take this time uh, to get the elements ready so you can partake with us, as we know many of you do. Uh, what a blessing to us to know that. And so we welcome you. We're glad that you're joining with us. So why don't we pray before we get started uh, tonight, really looking forward to our time together in God's Word. Uh, amazing chapter. I know I say that every week, but this is a really interesting chapter. So let's pray. We'll ask God to bless our time. Loving Heavenly Father, we're needing for you now to just settle our hearts and quiet our minds as only you can, and, and just enable us to focus and concentrate and, and really listen to what it is that the Spirit would say to us, your church. Lord, we want to have ears to hear. And Lord, when you speak, we, we don't want to just be hearers of your word. We want to be doers too. And so Lord, tonight I know that you're going to speak. You always do. It's not a question of if you're speaking or not. The question is, are we hearing and taking heed to your word? So Lord, bless our time together tonight and speak. Your servants are listening. We ask you for this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right. I want to talk to you tonight about both why it is and how it is that God is the only one who gets the glory. How cliche, right? I mean, we sing it, we know it, we read it, we hear it. But chapter 10 here in Isaiah provides us with profound life lessons in this regard. And specifically, as it relates to our own propensity to become arrogant and haughty, fancying ourselves as the ones who, in the strength of our own hand, are the ones that do it, and should get the credit for it. As we're about to see, the chapter starts off with the fourth of four parts. We saw three of them in chapter 9. So this is the fourth of four, where Isaiah is prophesying concerning God using the Assyrians as an instrument of His judgment on His people. And never think for a second that God takes delight in judging His people. He gives us so much time in His long suffering, in His patience to repent. But there does come a time where God has to chastise, rebuke, correct, and judge. And He's about to do that. And He's about to use the evil, wicked, I mean the evil of the Assyrians is unspeakable. That's not hyperbole. What they would do, we're going to get a glimpse of it tonight with what God says through Isaiah to His people. So He's going to use the Assyrians as an instrument in His hand, as He brings judgment now on His people. And here's what we're going to see. Assyria thinks they're the ones that have done it. And they become haughty in it, and arrogant because of it. So let's jump in. Verse 1, Woe, curse 
to those who decree unrighteous decrees, who write misfortune, which they have prescribed. He's speaking to his people here. To rob the needy, verse 2, of justice, and to take what is right from the poor of my people, that widows may be their prey, and that they may rob the fatherless, the widows and the orphans. This is what they were doing, and this is why God had to bring judgment upon them. It seems that the leaders of Israel were preying on and taking advantage of the weak and the vulnerable, the widow and the fatherless, and God takes note of it, which is why He will judge them for it. Listen to what Jesus said to the Pharisees in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 23, verse 14. It's uh, a little bit similar to the curse that Isaiah pronounces. He says, woe to you, a curse on you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Why? Oh, for you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore you will receive greater condemnation. Do you get the impression that God takes seriously the treatment of the weak and the vulnerable, the widow and the orphan? Listen to James. You're familiar with this in his epistle, chapter 1, verse 27. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Make no mistake about it. God takes note of our treatment of particularly the weak and the vulnerable. And He'll have the final word on it, as we're about to see. Verse 3, What will you do in the day of punishment? and in the day of desolation, which will come from afar, to whom will you flee for help? And where will you leave your glory? Without me they shall bow down among the prisoners. This is where we get a glimpse of the unspeakable evil of the Assyrians. This is not bowing down honoring, worshiping. No, this is bowing down in humiliation and shame. Again, it's unspeakable. I don't want to go into it or get graphic. For those of you that are students of God's Word, you know how evil the Assyrians were and what they would do. Again, unspeakable in the humiliation and, and torment, the torturing and they shall fall among the slain. For all this, and we read this in chapter 9, His anger is not turned away, but His hand is stretched out still. That's His mercy. Now here, God, through the prophet Isaiah, is saying, because you have treated them this way, in their time of need for help, so too will I not be there for you in your time of need and help. Second Chronicles chapter 15 verses 1 and 2. Now this is one of those passages, this is one of those places in God's Word where I think we would do well to pay attention, because there does come a point where God says, okay, have it your way. You know, we know it is a truth, it is a promise that He will never leave us or forsake us. Did you know there's a but there? And it's here in Second Chronicles 15 verses 1 and 2. Now, 
the Spirit of God came upon Azariah the son of Adad, and he went out to meet Asa, and said to him, Hear me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin, the Lord is with you while you are with Him. If you seek Him, He will be found by you. But if you forsake Him, He will forsake you. That should send chills up and down every single one of our spiritual spines, right? Because this is what happened to them then, and it can happen to us now. No, He will never leave us or forsake us. But if we turn our backs on Him, He's not going to force Himself on us. If we forsake Him, He'll forsake us. Verse 5, now we turn a corner here, instead of the woe to Judah, it's the woe to Assyria. The rod of my anger, and the staff in whose hand is my indignation. I will send him, verse 6, against an ungodly nation, and against the people of my wrath, I will give him charge to seize the spoil, to take the prey, and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. Yet, this is Assyria now, he does not mean so, nor does his heart think so, but it is in his heart to destroy and cut off not a few nations. And that's exactly what the Assyrians did. Now here again, the implications of this can be difficult to grasp in the sense that God here is using the wickedness of man as the instrument in His hand to judge and correct His people. Let that sink in. God is allowing the Assyrians to invade Judah, and God is using the Assyrians to bring His judgment upon His own people. A little hard to get your mind around, would you agree? Psalm 76.10, though, should help in understanding this and reconciling this. It says, Surely the wrath of man shall praise you. With the remainder of wrath you shall gird yourself. In other words, God may sometimes deem fit to allow our enemies as the instrument, the rod of His correction in His hands, to judge us, correct us, rebuke us, redirect us. And that's what He's doing here with the Assyrians. For He says, verse 8, Are not my princes altogether kings? Is not Calno like Carchemish? Is not Hamath like Arped? Is not Samaria like Damascus? As my hand has found the kingdoms of the idols, whose carved images excelled those of Jerusalem and Samaria, as, verse 11, I have done to Samaria and her idols, shall I not do also to Jerusalem and her idols? Verse 12, therefore, it shall come to pass, when the Lord has performed all His work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, that He will say, I will punish the fruit of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria, and the glory of his haughty looks. For He says, look, this is a, a sanctified mocking, if I can say it like that, for he, speaking of the king of Assyria, this is God mocking him, he says, by the strength of my hand I have done it, and by my wisdom, for I am prudent. Also I have removed the boundaries of the people, and have robbed their treasuries. So I have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man. You'll forgive the emphasis on I. It's been referred to as an eye problem. 
I will. I did. I have. I, yai, 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 yai. Again, emphasis mine. <laughs> My hand has found like a nest the riches of people, of the people. And as one who gathers eggs that are left, I have gathered all the earth. And there was no one who moved his wing, nor opened his mouth with even a peep. Oh, you don't say. Well, here again, this is what I wanted to talk about tonight and spend some time on tonight, because to me it's the main takeaway from this chapter. Assyria, the king of Assyria, thinks that it's him, that he's doing it, in the power of his might. And what we're about to see is that Assyria is in for a rude awakening. And it's kind of humorous here in verse 15. Shall the axe boast itself against him who chops with it? Or shall the saw exalt itself against him who saws with it, as if a rod could wield itself against those who lift it up, or as if a staff could lift up as if it were not wood. Oh my goodness. Can, can you indulge me for just a moment, okay? This is the instrument taking the credit. Okay, let, let's use this. This is a good illustration. If you've got a better one, let me know after the Bible study. So you go in for surgery, and the surgery, praise the Lord, is a success. And you're just so blessed, so thankful, so grateful. Thank you, Lord. And then you, you know, talk with the doctor, and you see the scalpel and the surgical instruments there on the uh, table in the operating room. And you go up to those instruments, and you begin to thank those instruments. They have uh, clinical terms for that, and <laughs> you would probably be institutionalized. What, in the, what, what are you doing? That was the instrument. I, I, I did it. I mean, how ridiculous would it be? You, you've got an axe, and you're, you're chopping with it. And the axe, after you're done chopping, stands up and takes a bow. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's, you see the humor in it? Please tell me you see the humor in this. It's not just me, right? How absurd, how ridiculous. That's the point. That's what Assyria was doing. Assyria was just the axe used to chop. Assyria was just the saw used to saw. And the staff. Can you imagine? I mean, you'll forgive me, and, and maybe we need to spend just a little bit more time on this, if for no other reason other than me, because this is me. As a pastor, pastors are the worst. I'm just saying, being open with you. You know how it is after a sermon or a Bible study, and one has likened it to the glorification of the worm ceremony. Oh, pastor, that was, that was, a, that was amazing. You are amazing. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm just the axe. I'm just the instrument. And woe unto me, if I should ever fancy myself as the one who did it. You know, I am keenly aware, and I've shared this before, and this is not, I, and I really mean this, and the Lord knows my heart. I am keenly aware that there are many times where God has you hear a different sermon than the one I preach, and thank God for that. No, I mean that. Because see, here's what happens. I'm just the mouthpiece, just the instrument, just the axe in His hands, the saw, the staff, the rod in His hands. 
And so when I teach, the Holy Spirit takes <laughs> I think the Holy Spirit, well, when I get to heaven, maybe I'll hear about it. But it's kind of like the Holy Spirit has a lot of work, and it is the work of the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit takes that, and before it reaches your ears, your heart, He tunes it to you. He, can I use this word, edits it, so that what you hear is what the Holy Spirit knows you need to hear. So you come up to me afterwards, you say, man, that was amazing. And I, I remember, this is a, many years ago, I always use illustrations from the mainland, so you don't like look at the person sitting next to you to see, oh, I wonder who he's talking about. So years ago on the mainland, I, you know, here, here I am, the glorification of the worm ceremony, and this precious saint comes up to me and she just says, oh, pastor, I was, I was just so blessed by the teaching, and God really spoke to me. And I, I like to hear that. God really ministered to me. And, and so I, I was just kind of curious. I've never done it since. You'll see why here in a moment. I asked her this question. What was it exactly that I said that really blessed you and ministered to you? And she said, excuse me? <laughs> you didn't say anything. This what the Lord s spoke to me. <laughs> I think I left early that day. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, oh yeah, no, I knew that. I knew that. I know. I just was curious, you know. One time my uh, wife, as only my wife can, and, and uh, I think God knew my wife had to have a sense of humor to be <laughs> be married to me. But, you know, she's, um, she's my best critic. You know we, how we say, you're, you're your own worst critic. Well, she's my best critic. So, and I never, I never ask her anymore, and she knows. And so sometimes she'll volunteer it. <laughs> so so what do you think of the, the teaching? You know, she says, you know, um, I was very blessed. I said, oh, really? Tell me more. <laughs> she says, you know what really blessed me about your teaching was when it ended. <laughs> no, that's a good thing, because it is a much needed reminder <laughs> that it's not me. It's not me. Hey, if God can speak through a donkey, He can speak through me. And I think pastors, and again, I'm speaking for myself, I'm being, I hope you're not uncomfortable with my openness, but I think pastors would do well to be reminded that it is not you. Never think, and never take the credit for that which the Lord alone has done. You know, maybe if I, if I may, uh, one more thing on this, and I think this is the Holy Spirit. I think about this often, quite often actually. Uh, we got this property, this building, absolute miracle. There's no question about it. Absolute miracle. It, it was the Lord. And He did it in such a way that even if we wanted to, we could not take credit for buying this property. And when it came time to renovating the building, God was so faithful to do it in such a way, so that when people would be sitting in this beautiful sanctuary, the people that would come to this building, and they would look at me as the pastor and say, Wow, you're amazing. Don't do that. If you only knew, you have no idea. How many times I'm in the fetal position, literally, again, not hyperbole. I'm in the fetal, oh God, you know, like I'm this great man of faith. What a visionary. Visionary? This is my vision? Th this was God. And I could prove it, by the way. I got the scars to prove it, actually. God did this in such a way that only He gets the glory. And here's the thing. If I and the leadership of this church ever decided 
in our own pride, thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought, to just kind of, well, you know, hey, um, you know, I did have a part in it. (gasps) Game over. Game over. No flesh will glory in His presence. You know, God has blessed this ministry exceedingly abundantly above and beyond anything that we could have ever thought or imagined. I'm told, and uh, we have amazing people that God has called to this ministry. I'm told that the international ministry is just growing like crazy all over the world. And (laughs) if you were to ask me, I mean, first of all, I could have never come up with this. I could have never strategized and planned and projected and, you know, plotted. And it's it's kind of like God did it, and I'm just hanging on for the ride, (laughs) hanging on for dear life, having the time of my life watching God do what He's doing and staying out of His way. Again, if you were to ask me, uh, why, how is it that, I mean, come on, look at you. I look at me every time I look in the mirror. I know what you mean. I mean, how, what, this makes no sense. I mean, who, who would have ever known? You are like the last person on the planet. And that's why God chooses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. But of course man wants to try to figure it out. What's the secret to the growth of the ministry? What kind of programs do you have? (laughs) Programs? I don't have any programs. (laughs) Yeah, but certainly you must have some sort of a, you know, five-year plan or some sort of a strategy that you, you know. uh, No. You know what I do? I just stay out of God's way. This is God's church. This ministry belongs to the Lord and the glory belongs to the Lord. You know, uh, whenever I have opportunity to share, there, there's occasion where I'll be with other pastors and we'll kind of go around, hey, what, what's God doing in your ministries? And I always, and for me, this is, this is quite a, a miracle unto itself, but I, I'm speechless. I don't know what to say. That doesn't happen very often. But I just, I really don't know what to say, because there's nothing I can, I can say, well, you know, here, here's, you know, what we're doing. What are you doing? Nothing. <laughs> I mean that. Oh, but come on, certainly you're doing something. No, God's doing everything. So, but surely you must have, nope. See, here's what I know. <laughs> God is looking for somebody that is going to just let Him do what He wants to do, and stay out of His way, and not try to help Him out. It's kind of like, you know, God saying, you want to help me? Don't help me. That'll help me if you don't help me. You know, when your kids were small and so adorable, right? You got this project, and you're like, oh, Baba, can, can we help? I'm like, okay, fine. I, I mean, they're just so adorable. And then you let them, and they make such a mess of it. And you, you know that it's going to take you like five hours to do that, which you could have done in maybe 30 minutes, had they not helped you out. I mean, so many times it's like God just knocking, hello, JD, that's you with me. (laughs) You're adorable. Can I I help you? No, just no, don't help me. That'll help me if you don't help me. See, there's something I want to do. 
and I just need you to let me. And if you'll let me, I will blow your mind. I will do things that if I told you about them, you wouldn't believe it. When we first moved here, started a Bible study, I mean, before even the church was officially planted, I, if you would have come to me, this is 2004, whew, long time ago. If you would have come to me in 2004 and said, in the year 2021, first of all, if you would have told me about what the world's going to be like in 2021, I would have sent you to the institution. <laughs> But if you would have told me that in 2021, you were going to have this profound privilege of pastoring the most amazing church in the world, the most loving church in the world, and to the uttermost parts of the world, I would have not believed you. And here we are, all of these years later, I look back on it, and the greatest thing that I did was nothing at all, and just stayed out of God's way and let Him have His way. And then when you do that, and He has His way, <laughs> and He does exceedingly abundantly above and beyond anything you could have ever imagined, then He's the only one that can take the credit for it. I mean, even if you, it would be laughable if you tried. And this is what I love about you, because you know me. And you know it's not me. You know it's God. Because, again, after all, I mean, look at you, Pastor. I mean, it has to be the Lord. Yeah, but Pastor's smart and savvy and shrewd. Stop. No. Everything that has happened with this ministry has happened because God did it. In spite of us, in spite of me, not because of me. Never imagine God looks at us and says, hey, uh, you're kind of special. I think I'll choose and use you. Because, <laughs> I mean, you're special. No, He looks at you and says, I could use that guy. I could use them. Because I know that when I do what I'm going to do through them, there's no way that they could take the credit for it. And they won't try to. And that's why again, God uses and chooses the foolish to confound the wise. We're only the instruments in the hands of the Master. Verse 16, Therefore the Lord, the Lord of hosts, will send leanness among His fat ones, and under His glory He will kindle a burning like the burning of a fire. So the light of Israel will be for a fire, and His Holy One for a flame. It will burn and devour His thorns and His briars in one day. And verse 18, it will consume the glory of His forest and of His fruitful field, both soul and body, and they will be as when a sick man wastes away. Then, verse 19, the rest of the trees of His forest will be so few in number that a child may write them. And it shall come to pass in that day, listen very carefully, that the remnant of Israel, and such as have escaped of the house of Jacob, will never again depend on Him who defeated them, but will depend on the Lord. They're going to learn their lesson the hard way. The Holy One of Israel, in truth, the remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. For though your people, O Israel, be as the sand of the sea, 
a remnant of them will return. The destruction decreed shall overflow with righteousness. For the Lord God of hosts will make a determined end in the midst of all the land. Therefore, verse 24, thus says the Lord God of hosts, O my people who dwell in Zion, do not be afraid of the Assyrian. Hang on to that. I want to come back to that. <laughs> if I'm in Judah at this time, and the prophet Isaiah proclaims this, and prophesies this, and declares this, and says this, don't be afraid of Assyria. Uh, Isaiah, with all due respect, as a prophet of God, they're on their way. They're coming, and they're going to invade us. And they're going to leave a wake of destruction in their path, as they always do. And you're saying, don't be afraid. We are paralyzed in fear. No, don't be afraid. And here's why. Listen. He shall strike you with the rod, and lift up his staff against you in the manner of Egypt, for yet a very little while, and the indignation will cease, as will my anger in their destruction. In other words, I'm going to allow them to come, and judgment will come, and yet a very little while my anger will be satiated, and my indignation will cease. And the Lord, verse 26, of hosts, will stir up a scourge for him, like the slaughter of Medean, again a reference to Gideon, we talked about that last week, at the rock of Oreb, as his rod was on the sea, speaking of Moses at the Red Sea, so will he lift it up in the manner of Egypt. It shall come to pass in that day, verse 27, that his burden will be taken away from your shoulder, and his yoke from your neck, and the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing oil. Uh, some commentators have suggested that better translated, this would be because of the anointed one. Why is that important? Why do I emphasize that? Because this is not, he's not doing this because of them. He's doing this because he has a covenant with them. He's made a promise to them. He is not going to let them be completely and utterly destroyed by the Assyrians. The Assyrians have a limit to that which God will allow them to do as the instrument of judgment and correction, the rod of correction in His hand. And they can do no more. They can do no more. God will limit the enemy in our lives. God will only allow the enemy to do that which God will allow him to do, to correct us, discipline us, chastise us. Why? Because he loves us. If he didn't love us, he wouldn't bother. That's how we know we're his children, the writer of Hebrews says. I mean, right? you know you're a child of God when you get a spanking. Because He's your child. I mean, you're His child, right? If I'm in a restaurant, which I'm not anymore, <laughs> everything's takeout now. But let's just say, for purpose of illustration, I'm in a restaurant. And I'm sitting across from a family with young children. And they are so disorderly, and they're running around, they're throwing food all over the place, and mom and dad aren't doing anything. Let's just say, again, purpose of illustration. Not, I would never do this. I don't think I would do this. But <laughs> I get up from the table, 
and I give those children a good spanking. <gasps> you can't do that. Why? Because they're not your kids. Oh, so <laughs> let's say that you see somebody get up and give them a spanking. Oh, you must be the parent. Yeah, because that's my kid. And I'm disciplining them. That's how you know. I mean, other than the genetic, you know, similarities. I mean, look, they look like you. <laughs> Chip off the old block. Thank God for my wife's gene pool with our children. But that's how you know. And that's how we know that we're His, because He chastises us. Don't despise the chastening, the chastening, the discipline of the Lord. It's because He loves you. He loves you so much. He loves His people. Again, never think for a moment that God takes delight in this. It's not that God wants to do this, God has to do this. You know, when our children were young, <laughs> we used to tell them that, you know that, you've said this, right, to your kids, this is going to hurt me a lot more than it's going to hurt you. Like children at that age believe you when you say that? It's going to hurt you? more than it's going to hurt me. What? And then we'll say something like this, I'm doing this because I love you. To which the child usually responds, I wish you would love me less. <laughs> but if you think about it, if you didn't love them, fine, go ahead. I don't care. I don't love you. You want to destroy your life? Fine, go ahead, go ahead. That's a horrible way to say it, but you know, sometimes I wonder, do, do we see God that way? Do we misunderstand the correction, the rod of correction in our lives? Sometimes, I know in my own life, I've misunderstood, misinterpreted the correction of God as God being angry with me. God's not angry with me. God loves me. He loves me enough to correct me and discipline me. My problem was, and it took me a long time to learn this, but what I was doing, <laughs> greatly erring in doing so, was I was looking at my Heavenly Father through the eyes of my earthly father who was always angry, disciplined in anger. And so I just naturally assumed that whenever I got disciplined, I, that God was angry with me. He's not angry with me. He's not angry with you. He loves you so much. And He loves His people. And He will restore them. And a remnant will return. This is a correction and a redirection. And did you catch where Isaiah says to them that you will never rely on anyone else ever again? You know, we just got done in Second Chronicles where King Asa is confronted. You know what he did? He basically did the same thing that the other kings did. He made an alliance, relied upon the king of Syria made an alliance with them, depended on them and not the Lord. And by the way, uh, that was Second Chronicles 15. When you get to Second Chronicles 16, I want to say it's about verse 9. It's a passage, a verse I'm sure you're familiar with. You've heard it before. It goes something like this. Don't you know that the eyes of the Lord are searching to and fro throughout the earth, looking for hearts fully devoted to Him, so He can be strong on their behalf. That was to, through a prophet, a prophecy to King Asa, after he had made this alliance with and relied upon and gave the credit to Syria instead of the Lord. No flesh is going to glory in my presence. Oh, you're, you're relying on them? you're giving the credit to them. It actually worked out. It actually succeeded, which is even worse. It was a strategy that actually worked. But the problem was, is that 
He made this alliance with this enemy nation who, this is exactly what Assyria does. They turn on God's people and destroy God's people. You're making a deal with the devil, man. And you do so to your own peril. And I love you so much, I've got to teach you a lesson. And this is the only way that I can do it. I have to allow the Assyrians to come against you. I think of that proverb, I uh, can't think offhand of the chapter and verse, but it goes something like this, when a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies to live at peace with him. That goes the other way too, right? When your ways are displeasing to the Lord, He'll allow the Assyrians in your life to come against you, and He'll use them as the rod of correction in your life. Well, verse 28, He has come to Ayath, He has passed Migron. Now picture this, the Assyrians are coming, and it's, it's like this wave as they approach Judah. He has passed Migron at Michmash. He has attended to his equipment. They have gone along the ridge. They have taken up lodging at Geba. Ramah is afraid. Gibeah of Saul has fled. Lift up your voice, O daughter of Galim. Cause it to be heard as far as Laish. O oh, poor Anathoth. In other words, all of these cities as the Assyrians descend on the way. Madmena has fled, the inhabitants of Gabim seek refuge. As yet he will remain at Nob that day. He will shake his fist at the mount of the daughter of Zion, the hill of Jerusalem. They're there. <laughs> Behold the Lord. The Lord of hosts will lop off the bow with terror. Those of high stature will be hewn down, and the haughty will be humbled. He will cut down the thickets of the forest with iron, and Lebanon will fall by the mighty one. Oh, the imagery here. You know, the mighty cedars of Lebanon, my birthplace. The cedar. I guess the, the best comparison for us modern day would be the, um, in uh, California, what, what are they, what are they called? I, okay. Redwood. Right? Pray for me. It's, it's even worse than that, actually. Those big, mighty redwoods. So we had an online member uh, actually brought, brought me a, what a wonderful gift, a small piece of a, of a redwood, and then uh, pictures of these, I don't know how old they are. I mean, the, the trunks of these trees are like as big, they would fill the sanctuary here huge. That's what the cedars of Lebanon was. Why do I point that out? Because what God is saying, yeah, I know that the Assyrians look mighty and large and strong. And I mean, they're, in fact, they're already here. I'm going to cut them down like the cedars of Lebanon. I'm going to humble them. And we know what happens, right? 185,000 men descend on Judah. They're encamped around about Jerusalem. And God, true to His word, because He has a covenant with Israel, and He made a promise to David that the Savior of the world would come from His lineage. And what the Assyrians were trying to do is not only depose the king, they were trying to completely destroy Jerusalem. God can't let that happen, because God has a covenant, because of who He is, in spite of them in spite of them. He's not doing this for them. He's doing this again because He has a covenant with them. So let's just take a moment here and picture this in our mind's eye. 
Isaiah has just said to them, do not be afraid of this Syrian. And here they come, and we're hearing about all these towns. They're all running for their lives, and they're on their way, and now they're there. And God says, I'll take care of this now. I'm going to take care of this for my glory. I'm going to do this because of who I am. And so an angel of the Lord is sent and kills all 185,000 of these men that had descended on Judah from Assyria. And the, the detail in the narrative is that the Israelites wake up in the morning and there's 185,000 dead Assyrians all around the city. That's why you're not to be afraid. I want to, before we partake together of communion, draw a parallel here. And it's something that, as I spent some time with the Lord this last week, preparing for Sunday's update, which once again just, I mean, it's really intense. And you might say that the Assyrian, our Assyrian, is advancing against us to destroy us. It's just a matter of time. They're on their way. It's happening. And what the Lord ministered to me was, like with them then, it's the same for us now. Do not be afraid of them. Because truth be known, and I think if we're honest with ourselves, <laughs> and we're in good company, by the way, throughout Scripture so many times. I think of Joshua, he comes to mind. Do not be afraid. Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid. Do not fear. Yeah, but do you know what they're coming with next? It's the stroke of a pen away. It's the click of a mouse away. That's, that's what's coming. The Assyrians are coming. And they're seeking to destroy us. And they're so evil, what they're planning. And God says, no, 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 no. Don't be afraid. I'll take care of it. Yeah, but they're here. 185,000 of them. I know. How cool is that? Watch me now. Watch me now. God's going to have the final word. God's going to have the final word. Because in the end, it is God who gets the glory. One last thing, and then we'll partake together. But I, I, I was thinking about Ezekiel 38. You know, we talk about this a lot, this prophecy where there's this alliance of nations that invades Israel with Russia, Iran, and Turkey at the helm. And they come against, and, I, and what reminded me of it was when Isaiah the prophet declares that it's going to happen in one day, and it did, it was really actually one night. The same thing is going to happen when Ezekiel 38 is fulfilled. You've got this great horde, this, this alliance of nations, superpowers, nuclear superpowers that are coming against little Israel, like the Assyrians then. And God says, uh, no, no, I'll take care of this. Watch me now. And there's an interesting detail at the end of chapter 38, because God says, here's why I'm going to do it. I'm going to do this this way, so that they will know that I am the Lord God. That's why I'm going to do it. So there's no mistake. So we're clear. I did that. No, it's the Israel, it's the Israeli Defense Force. No. I did it. I did it. I am the Lord God. You know, throughout Israel. Okay, this will be the last, last thing, and then we'll partake. Just bear with me. This is... This is uh, the Lord, I think. Throughout the Old Testament, when God would have, particularly Moses, 
have Aaron say to the people, I am the Lord your God who delivered you out of Egypt. Stay with me on this. Have you ever asked yourself where the emphasis was? Because I mean, it's just words, the Word of God certainly, but it's words on the pages of our Bible. So the, the emphasis can be, I am the Lord your God, I'm the Lord your God, or I believe the emphasis is on I. I. <laughs> the king of Assyria says, I, I did this. No. I am the Lord your God. I am the Lord your God who delivered you out of Egypt. So we're clear. I am the one who gets all the glory. I am the Lord your God. Well, uh, I tried to not go too long, so we wouldn't have to. We're not in a rush, right? You brought your pajamas and your toothbrush. No, it won't be that much longer. I'll have you out of here by 11. Those of you online, what, 2 a.m., 3 a.m.? I don't know what the time zone is. I like Luke's gospel account of the Last Supper, as we affectionately <laughs> refer to it. And, oh, here we are, uh, a few days away from that one day of the year where we celebrate the resurrection of the risen Savior, where the whole world is cognizant of, to one degree or another, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And here we are tonight celebrating what they celebrated as the Last Supper, the Passover, the Passover, because Jesus fulfilled the Passover prophecy. And so here they are in that upper room, and they're going to partake together, and it's the last time they will celebrate the Passover together. And so Luke writes, verse 14, when the hour had come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him. Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. He's, and we're going to talk about this on Sunday, but he has told them that he's going to go to the cross. He has to go to the cross. He has to die on that cross. But he also tells them that he will rise again. And he even goes further and says, and after I'm risen from the dead, I'm going to meet you in Galilee. And that's a very important detail. You'll have to come on Sunday to find out why that's an important detail. It's a very important detail. So he has just got done telling them that he's going to go to the cross. And by the way, it has completely rocked their world and shaken them to the core. And it has caused so much consternation on their part. So he says, I say to you, verse 16, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, this is the second time now, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Do you sense from this that Jesus eagerly, fervently waits for that time, that day, when what we're going to do tonight finds its ultimate fulfillment. And He took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is My body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of Me. For those of you here, if you'll take and just peel back the top layer, you'll have the bread. And just hold on to it for a moment. Those of you online, just hold on to the bread for just a moment before we partake. I suppose this is as good of a time as any to just mention briefly 
about the significance of the Passover. It was that tenth plague that came upon Egypt. And the Israelites were told to take a lamb and inspect it, put it on trial for four days, and not slay that lamb until the 14th. But for four days, they take it on the 10th day, four days, the exact number of days that Jesus was on trial. Now, at the end of the four days, that lamb had to be without blemish, without spot, without wrinkle, a picture of a prophecy about Jesus being without sin. And then they were to take that lamb and they were to break the body, the skin, not the bones. No bones could be broken, and no bones of the Savior were broken. Only the skin, the body, so the blood could come out. So they would break, and interesting, and we'll talk about this in a moment, his body was broken and bled in seven, the number of completion locations. So his body had to be broken for us. And so they would take now as a type that would foreshadow, as this prophecy, the coming Savior, who would be that Passover lamb. Because if they took this lamb without blemish, without spot, without wrinkle, and they slayed that lamb and took the blood of that lamb, and they put it on the doorposts of their house there in Egypt. The top, there was a basin at the bottom, and then the left and the right in the shape of a cross, before the Romans had ever come up with a cross as a form of crucifixion, cruel form by the way. So when the angel of death came, and the angel of death came, and took the firstborn son, interesting connection there as well. But if you had the blood of the lamb in the shape of a cross on the door of your house, that angel of death would pass over you, and you would be saved. And this would be a foreshadow of the coming Savior of the world who would fulfill that Passover prophecy. So as we partake together, we partake of this in remembrance of what He did, His body broken for us. Would you partake with me? Thank you, Lord. Lord, thank You so much for giving us this to do in remembrance of You, particularly at a time like this, where we remember your crucifixion, your burial, and your resurrection. Lord, thank you for going to that cross for us, instead of us. Luke goes on to write, likewise, he, speaking of Jesus, also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Again, for those of you here, if you'll take and peel back the remainder of the packaging, and those of you watching online, if you'll just again hold on to the cup. So again, we hold in our hands a symbol this time not of the body, the broken body of Jesus, but the blood of Jesus. And Jesus says to them that this blood is the blood of the new covenant. My blood is shed for you. Why? For the remission of sins. There is no remission of sin without the shedding of blood. I'm going to shed my blood in your stead. This is the blood of the new covenant. And he says, I want you to, as you do this, do so in remembrance of me. And they would have got it, because the Passover celebration to this day in Israel is huge. Watch I-24 News. It's all about the Passover. It is such an important feast. And again, the, 
the blindness on the part of Israel, they just can't see it. They're blind to it. That whenever they celebrate the Passover, they are celebrating Jesus Christ who fulfilled the Passover. So here's the blood now. Seven places, the number of completion, because it is a picture of the finished, completed work on the cross. Do you want to count them just real quick? Both feet, two, hands, four, back, five. He was whipped, back, five. The crown of thorns on the head, I mean deep into the skull. And then the final, the seventh and final place that he bled from was from his side, when the soldier was commanded to thrust the sword into his side to make sure he was dead. And out of his side came two elements, blood and water, the two elements present at birth, and that was the birth of the church, the bride from his side as the second and final Adam, just as God took with the first Adam the rib from his side for his bride, so too with the second and final Adam, because with Adam sin entered the world, and Jesus as the second and final Adam came into the world to pay for that sin. And so as with Adam a bride from His side, so too with Jesus a bride from His side was birthed. I don't know if it's possible to overstate the importance of that which we are celebrating tonight, but as we partake together of this cup, let's do so not only in remembrance of Him, but that this symbol that we hold in our hands, that we're going to partake of, is a symbol of His shed blood that has paid in full for all of our sin. Would you partake with me? And once you do, please stand. Let's have the worship team come up before I pray. Have they left the building? (laughs) That wasn't too bad. Don't look at your watches yet. Thank you, Lord. Loving Father in Heaven, I I think that when I pray this and say this, I do so with the agreement of everyone that is here in this Bible study tonight, that there is no way, it's really impossible for us to thank You enough for what You did for us. Lord, thank You for purchasing us paying in full the price. Thank You for dying on the cross, defeating death in Your resurrection. Thank You for the good news that soon and very soon You're coming back to take us out of this world. We believe it is sooner than any of us can imagine. And what we did tonight was a much needed reminder of that, because it's very easy for us to forget with the busyness and the stress and the pressures of life, especially now in this world that we're living in, with the Assyrians at our door. (laughs) And we need this to remind us that there is a remnant, that you will have the final word. Just as you have defeated death, you will defeat the enemy of our soul. 
And as you said to them then, in celebrating that Passover with them, that you are eagerly awaiting that day when what we did here tonight will be fulfilled in your kingdom. And so too, Lord, do we eagerly await, fervently desire. It's just too high for our understanding that that day very soon, we believe, is coming. And what we did here tonight, we're going to do with you at your table, at the wedding feast of the Lamb. Oh Lord, come quickly, Maranatha, in Jesus' name, Amen.